to the Blessed Sacrament. And I thought that was so appropriate because it ties in with Divine Mercy. It's all about uh, God's great gift to us. So last week we were together, we were wrapping up a little bit about the um, indulgences to how to earn an indulgence in the year of St. Joseph. And we reviewed um, all the requirements of what that would take and what that would be about. We also talked a little bit last week about Holy Week and all the beautiful things um, that were going on behind the scenes that you didn't know about leading up with, with Palm Sunday and then the church getting ready for Chrism Mass and the renewal of the priestly, um, the priestly vows. It's such a beautiful thing to held down in St. Joseph's Cathedral here in Buffalo. Um, it was a beautiful opportunity. My husband and I got to go to there to bring back the holy oils that are used at our parish. Um, and then that kind of led us right through to um, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and of course, the celebration of the Vigil on Saturday night and Easter Sunday celebration. We also talked a little bit last week about the, um, talked a little bit about, um, what did we talk about anything from it? We talked about the Divine Mercy Novena because it started on Good Friday. So we're hoping that you're joining us in praying the Chaplet of Divine Mercy and praying for the intentions of the Novena to, um, to then celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday and all the gifts and graces that are poured out upon us. Um, and so with that, we closed last week with Mary's Way of the Cross, the Stations According to the Heart of Mary, which was such a beautiful way. Um, and so with that, we're going to get started on this week's um, presentation. So... Okay, and I'm going to begin by speaking about uh, how you know Jesus uses the simple people, simple ordinary people, to proclaim his message and to build up his church. Uh, the apostles were ordinary people; they 
weren't the, uh, the elite in the uh, Jewish community. They were just ordinary people. And he used them to build up his church. And in the year early 1900s, he used this very simple Polish nun, Sister Faustina, to um, bring, over, bring about his message or to proclaim his message of mercy. That was a special message for this time in the world's history. And so S Sister Faustina, she was born as Helen Kowalska in 1905, 1905, in Poland, to a poor religious family. She was the third of ten children. And she, at a very tender age, was known for her love of prayer, diligence and obedience, and concern for the poor. She was called to a religious life during a vision of Christ's passion. Um, and in 1925, entered the Congregation of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy and took the name Sister Maria Faustina of the Most Blessed Sacrament. She lived as a member of the congregation for 13 years, residing in Krakow, Bach, and Vil Vilnius, where she worked as a cook, gardener, and a porter. She zealously performed her tasks and faithfully observed the rule of religious life. Uh, she recollected yet every, every natural, very natural, serene, and full of kindness and disinterested love of her neighbor. Although her life was apparently insignificant and monotonous, she hid within herself an extraordinary union with God. The mystery of God's mercy, which she contemplated in the Word of God as well, of her, as, well as her everyday activities, forms the basis of her spirituality. By contemplating and getting to know the mystery of God's mercy, she developed the attitude of childlike trust in God and of mercy toward her neighbor. St. Faustina was also a faithful daughter of the church. Conscious of her role in the church, she cooperated with God's mercy in the task of saving poor sinners. At the specific request of the Lord Jesus, and following his example, she made a sacrifice of her own life for the sake of sinners. Her spiritual life was distinguished as well by a deep love of the Holy Eucharist and a special devotion to Mary as the Mother of Mercy. She spent years in the convent and they were, she had extraordinary gifts, such as revelations, visions, hidden stigmata, participation in the passion of the Lord, by location, reading of human souls, prophecy, and the rare gift of mystical espousal and marriage. Her relationship with God, the Blessed Mother, the angels, saints, the souls in purgatory, with the entire supernatural world, was as real for her as it, what she perceived with her senses. The Lord chose Sister Faustina to achieve three tasks in her mission. First, reminding the world and the church of the truth of God's mercy for every human being as revealed in Holy Scriptures. Secondly, to entreat divine mercy for the whole world, especially for poor sinners, through the practice of new forms of devotion to the divine mercy. And lastly, to initiate the apostolic movement of divine mercy, the followers of which proclaim and entreat divine mercy for the world and strive to practice the works of mercy by following the example of Sister Faustina. She recorded various aspects of her mission in her diary, which she kept at the request of her spiritual director, Father Michael Sopako, and later at the command of our Lord Jesus himself. She faithfully wrote down all of the Lord's wishes and described the encounters between her soul and him. Consumed by tuberculosis and innumerable sufferings, which she offered for poor sinners. Sister Faustina died in Krakow at the age of 33 on October 5th, 1938. Her mortal remains rest at the Shrine of the Divine Mercy near Krakow. Yet even before her death, the devotion to Divine Mercy as revealed in her diary had begun to spread. During the tragic war years of 1939 through 1945, this devotion grew in strength as people throughout Poland and Lithuania turned to our merciful Savior for comfort and hope. In 1941, the devotion was brought to the U.S. from Poland by Father Joseph Jarzabowski. 
as a member of the Congregation of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, he had first been skeptical about the great graces received by those who entrusted themselves to divine mercy. But in the spring of 1940, he vowed to uh, spend the rest of his life spreading divine mercy if the Lord would get him back, safely back, to his fellow Marians in America. And so he began an extraordinary journey from Poland through Lithuania into Russia, across Siberia, into Vladivostok, Vladivostok, and from there to Japan and finally to the United States in 1941. So he was able to leave Japan before they bombed Pearl Harbor in, in uh, December and was able to make it back. And he didn't waste any time in following up on the vow that he made to proclaim the message of divine mercy. And he had the help of the Felician sisters in Michigan and Connecticut. And the, his brother Marians of the Immaculate Conception also undertook a uh, great devotion to divine mercy and helped him spread the message. And by 1953, some 25 million pieces of divine mercy literature had been distributed throughout the world. In 1958 and 59, St. Faustina's prophecy about the apparent destruction of divine mercy work began to be fulfilled. The Holy See received inaccurate and confusing translations of her diary entries, and they were unable to verify the truth of those entries because of the political conditions. And so during the period, they banned the prom promulgation of the devotion in the spreading of the devotion. Then, 20 years later, in 1978, the ban was completely lifted, thanks to the intervention of the Archbishop of Krakow, Cardinal Carol Wotiwa. Through his efforts, they began in 1965 to translate her uh, diary, her diary, her writings again, and then, in April 15, 1978, the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith reversed the earlier ban and then allowed this devotion and divine mercy message to be proclaimed throughout the church. Six months later, Cardinal Carol Wotiwa became Pope John Paul II. Then, in Pope John Paul II canonized Sister Faustina as the first saint of the great Jubilee year. And again, it was on Divine Mercy Sunday. In fact, the Holy Father also announced during his homily that the second Sunday of Easter would now be celebrated as Divine Mercy Sunday throughout the Universal Church. In his homily, John Paul said, Today my joy is truly great in presenting the life and witness of Sister Faustina Kowalska to the whole church as a gift of God for our time. By divine providence, the life of this humble daughter of Poland was completely linked with the history of the 20th century, the century we have just left behind. And so that was a great ray of hope for all of mankind with all of the, the crazy uh, difficulties that we had in the 20th century of, of uh, many wars, and many horrible new weapons that were brought about that uh, created mass destruction. So with that, I'm gonna call Catherine up and she will continue. Okay, and we are, um, <laughs> we're really excited to bring to you some information about Divine Mercy, Sister Faustina, and this amazing feast coming up this Sunday. So one of the most important things is to remember that Mercy um, is for all of us. God's mercy wishes, he wishes to reach every single one of us. And that mercy is a particular kind of love. Isn't that beautiful? 
give mercy to someone is a particular kind of love. When love encounters suffering, poverty, brokenness, and sin, it mercifully takes action to do something about it. Mercy is love going out to those in misery. Um, so divine mercy, among other things, is love poured out on sinful humanity to free it from sin and its consequences. Um, the other thing that I was reading, because I thought this was rather interesting, is that mercy is not just something that God suggests, but it's something he demands of us. So to learn a little bit about it, about divine mercy, makes it very simple. Uh, the book Tom and I have, and it kind of explains it, is you need to understand the ABCs of mercy. To ask for divine mercy, to ask for God's mercy. B is to be merciful to others. C, to completely trust in Jesus. ABCs. I'm going to go over them a little more in depth. A is to ask for God's mercy. God wants us to approach Him, to repent, to be sorrowful for our sins, and to ask Him to pour out His mercy upon us and upon the whole world. I think that's what's so beautiful about the chaplet of divine mercy. We're not just praying for ourselves and our loved ones, we're praying for the whole world. He asks us through the Apostle of Divine Mercy, St. Faustina, and these are his words, these are the words he tells us. I cannot punish even the greatest sinner if he makes an appeal to my compassion. But on the contrary, I justify him in my unfathomable and inscrutable mercy. It's Diary Entry 1146. Jesus goes on to tell Sister Faustina for us. I do not want to punish aching mankind, but I desire to heal it, pressing it to my most merciful heart. That comes from Diary Entry 1588. The Lord makes it clear that when this healing begins, it begins in the confessional for you and I. Sacrament of Reconciliation and Confession is so important. Through the Sacrament of Reconciliation, Confession brings to us the very best way to ask, free ourselves from our sins, to be purified of our sins, and to ask for God's mercy. And Jesus goes on to remind us that we need not fear to ask his mercy. And these are his words coming up. When you approach the confessional, know this, that I myself am waiting there for you. I am only hidden by the priest, but I myself act in your soul. Here the misery of the soul meets the very mercy of God. That's entry 1602. Jesus did not come just for those leading holy lives spent very little time with those. He came for the sinners. He came for us who have fallen and gotten up and fallen and gotten up and sometimes remain fallen. He came for us. He tells us through Sister Faustina, these are his words, the greater the sinner, the greater the right he has to my mercy. And that comes from entry 723. So we who are sinners, we who seek forgiveness and healing, have but one thing to do. Go, ask God for his mercy. Ask the mercy from Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? The second part of the ABCs is B. Be merciful to others. It actually comes from, a, you know, from what the Lord told us, to be merciful as our Father in heaven is merciful. God wants us to receive his mercy, and in turn wants us to be merciful to others by our actions, words, and prayers. He wants to extend love and forgiveness to others. He wants of us to follow his example, to share love and forgiveness to others. 
I said a few minutes ago, it's not something he asks, it's something he actually demands from you and I. Mercy is love that seeks to relieve the misery of others. It is an active love poured out upon others to heal, to comfort, to console, and to forgive. Mercy is the love that God wants to offer to us, and indeed it is the love he demands from us for each other. Wow. So many of the parables, the Good Samaritan, the rich man, and Lazarus, the return of the prodigal son, all demonstrate the essential truth that having received mercy, we have an obligation then to share it to others. If God isn't judging us and he's offering us mercy, we need to share that to others. And to remember this comes from Matthew's Gospel. We will be judged on the basis of our merciful actions toward others. Pretty powerful. We're going to be judged by our actions, of how merciful we have been to others. Our Lord speaks to us through St. Faustina about the importance of the deeds of mercy. And he says in his in a diary entry, 742, I demand from you deeds of mercy, which are to arise out of love for me. You are to show mercy to your neighbors always and everywhere. You must not shrink from this or try to excuse or absolve yourself from this or to try to, um, I'm sorry, try to absolve yourself from this. Even the strongest faith is of no avail without works. So Jesus is telling us that our deeds of mercy aren't coming to from us out of duty, but of our great love for God. You love someone, you wish to serve them, you wish to have deeds of kindness, and goodness, and mercy. And that's what God is asking of us for those, um, for those around us. He said our neighbors and our family and those we don't even know. He tells us in entry 13, 17, if a soul does not exercise mercy, somehow or other, it will not obtain my mercy on the day of judgment. We offer merciful works through the spiritual works of, um, corporal and spiritual works of mercy. The C is to have complete trust in Jesus. Jesus told Sister Faustina, Mankind will not have peace until it turns to my mercy. It's pretty powerful. The Lord tells Sister Faustina in various writings of the diary, I have opened my heart as a living fountain of mercy. Let all souls draw light from it. Let them approach this sea of mercy with great trust. On the cross, the fountain of my mercy was opened wide by the lance for all souls. No one have I excluded. Keep that in mind. No one has been excluded from that. I am offering people a vessel with which they are to keep coming for graces to the fountain of mercy. That vessel is the image with the signature, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. The graces of my mercy are drawn by means of one vessel only, and that is trust. The more a soul trusts, the more it will receive. Trust is a living faith. By trusting, we agree not to dwell on our past or be worried and fearful of the future. We entrust our entire existence to the providence of God. God wants you to know that the graces of his mercy can only be received by us through trust. We received a beautiful email from a friend of mine just the other day. And we thought it was rather appropriate, so I wanted to read it to you. This comes from a friend um, in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And Father Seraphim, who Tom just spoke about, had mentioned Father Seraphim is a Marian of the Immaculate Conception priest. He's recently passed away, but he was 
um, go to priest on divine mercy. And these were what he had mentioned. I want to share this. He mentioned that in the book of Hebrews, there is a passage about the blood and water being put on the doorposts in the Exodus story of the Old Testament. But he also knows that the Old in the Old Testament, the Exodus story only speaks about blood being put on a doorpost. However, Father Seraphim discovered that the hyssop branch contains water inside of itself. So when the Israelites smashed the hyssop, hyssop branch that was dipped into the blood and put across the doorpost, blood and water would have come out of the doorpost. This shows us how God had already in the Old Testament prefigured the piercing of Jesus' divine heart, which gushed forth with blood and water to be put on the doorpost of our heart and on the whole world. Isn't that beautiful town, I thought that was, was a pretty cool thing, pretty amazing. Um, okay, now I'm going to quickly go through, this is really another great way to remember the devotion to divine mercy, with a little bird called the Fitch, F-I-N-C-H, Feast, Image, Novena, Chaplet, and Hour. I give you a little bit of information on the feast. To celebrate the Feast of Divine Mercy Sunday is not a secondary feast, it is a primary feast day to be celebrated, hopefully, in all parishes. To celebrate the feast, to go to confession a few days in advance or a few days right after the feast day, and to have complete sorrow and repentance of your sins. To have an attitude of mercy, to do works of mercy, a merciful attitude toward others prepares your heart for, this, for the feast day. To receive Holy Communion worthily in the state of grace, free from mortal sin. To trust in Jesus. Lay it all at his feet. Jesus, I trust in you. To venerate the image. So how do we venerate the image? So the important things are to um, the works of, uh, to keep the feast day is to celebrate the feast day, which is coming up on Sunday. You need to get to confession, receive Holy Communion worthily. You would need to have repentance in your heart for your sorrow of your sins. You have a merciful uh, attitude toward others, to trust in Jesus, and to venerate the image. We found this also very, very interesting. That as far back as the 4th century, St. Augustine, a doctor of the church, in the 4th century, called the eight days of Easter, referring to it as the octave, the, as the days of mercy and pardon. So from Easter Sunday for eight days to the following Sunday, in this 4th century, St. Augustine called those eight days the octave, Days of mercy and pardon. Wow. Uh, and then in a sermon he gave on the Sunday after Easter, he called it the summary of all the days of mercy. So these days, this week, from Easter Sunday to divine mercy, are days of great mercy for us to put into practice what we're learning about how to be merciful. Um, okay, the next thing is to kind of talk to you about finches. Feast, the next is the image of divine mercy. And I think we're going to show you the beautiful image of divine mercy. And, um, and that is an important, important um, graces that actually come from it. When Sister Faustina first went to have the picture um, painted, she was very disappointed in it. But Jesus reassured her that the importance is not in how perfect the image is. It's not what's important. What is important, what is important is the, um, um, the graces that will flow from this beautiful, beautiful image. Um, so, the, uh, the image 
is a beautiful image of Christ. And this is how he appeared to Sister Faustina. And he promised that all those who worship and venerate and love the image promises through this image in her diary. I promise that the soul that will venerate this image will not perish. I also promise victory over its enemies already here on earth, especially at the hour of death. I myself will defend it as my own glory. And he continued, I am offering people a vessel with which they are to keep coming for graces. The vessel is this image with the signature, Jesus, I trust in you. By means of this image, I shall grant many graces for souls. An important part of it comes from the beautiful rays that emanate from the heart of Jesus. The red ray and the white ray, the pale ray, the red one represents blood and the white one represents water. These two rays defeat Satan's only two weapons, sin and death. Sin is wiped away by the cleansing waters of baptism, the healing words of confession. Death is wiped away by life, and life to the Jews was in the blood. Blood provides us life, so we receive life in Holy Communion. These rays represent what Christ asks for us on the Feast of Divine Mercy Sunday. Go to confession. Receive Holy Communion. In the image, the left foot stepping forward is symbolic of Christ coming to us, searching for us, us, his lost sheep. And also, he's coming at the return at the end of time. We have received countless testimonies, and there are countless testimonies of many little sheep who have been healed, protected, and conversions through this amazing, amazing image. And with that, um, that's the image of divine mercy and all that it offers to all of us. We're going to go on and my husband's going to continue. Um, I guess the one other, one other uh, quote I would like to read is that um, those who will come to me on Divine Mercy Sunday will be forgiven their souls they go to confession, they go to Holy Communion, they have the intention. Their souls will be wiped clean as if their very first baptism day was. So with that, my husband's going to come up and continue. Finch. Okay, so she did the feast and the image, and I'll talk to you briefly about the novena. The novena to Divine Mercy um, was given to St. Faustina in 1937. On Good Friday, Jesus requested that she make a special novena before the Feast of Mercy. From Good Friday to the following Saturday, he himself dictated the intentions for each day by means of a specific prayer she was to bring to his heart a different group of souls each day and thus immerse them in the ocean of his mercy, begging the Father on the strength of Jesus' passion for graces for those souls. Unlike the Novena of Chaplets, this, well, okay. The wide range of intentions, which do not include personal needs, makes the great popularity of this Novena all the more astounding. In this Novena, we truly make the Lord's intentions our own, a beautiful expression of the Church's privilege and duty as the Bride of the Lord to be an intercessor at Christ's side on the throne of mercy. And I'll just read to you the, uh, what the intentions are for each day, and they are very beautiful, and you can see how amazing they are. The first day, we bring to Jesus all mankind, especially all sinners. It kind of sums it up as all of us, doesn't it? The second day, bring to me, bring to Jesus, the souls of priests and religious. The third day, bring all devout and faithful souls. The fourth day, those who do not believe in God and those who do not yet know Jesus. The fifth day, the souls of those who have separated themselves from the church. 
the sixth day, the meek and the humble souls, the souls of little children, the seventh day, the souls who especially venerate and glorify my mercy, the eighth day, the souls who are detained in purgatory, and on the last day, the ninth day, souls who have become lukewarm. And so these are all beautiful, uh, beautiful prayers that basically they begin and they, they extol the Father uh, and ask Jesus and ask him, based on the merits of Jesus, to uh, pour, pour out all the possible graces to these different groups of souls. So it really is a, a reaching out, not for ourselves and not for personal intentions. They are for others, all of them. So it's a beautiful novena to pray from Good Friday through the Saturday uh, after Easter. And that, that is the Divine Mercy Novena. Next, I will talk to you a little bit about the Divine Mercy Chaplet. So we're F-I-N is the Novena, now the Chaplet, the C. The Chaplet of Divine Mercy, um, St. Faustina had a vision of an angel sent by God to chastise a particular city. And she began to pray for mercy, but her prayers were powerless. Suddenly she saw the Holy Trinity and felt the power of Jesus' grace within her. At the same time, she found herself pleading with God for mercy with words that she heard interiorly. Those words were, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us. And so that was what she heard interiorly. As she continued saying this inspired prayer, the angel that was sent to chastise the city became helpless and could not carry out the deserved punishment. The next day, she again heard this interior voice instructing her how to recite the prayer that our Lord later called the chaplet. This time, after have mercy on us, they added, the words were added, and on the whole world. From then on, she recited this form of prayer almost constantly, offering it especially for the dying. In subsequent revelations, the Lord made it clear that the chaplet was not just for her, but for the whole world. He also attached extraordinary promises to the recit recitation of the chaplet. He said, encourage souls to say the chaplet which I have given you. Whoever will recite it will receive great mercy at the hour of death. When they say this chaplet in the presence of the dying, I will stand between my father and the dying person, not as the just judge, but as the merciful savior. Priests will recommend it to sinners as their last hope of salvation. Even if there were a sinner most hardened, if he were to recite this chaplet only once, he would receive grace from my infinite mercy. I desire to grant an unimaginable graces to these souls who trust in my mercy. Through the chaplet, you will obtain everything if what you ask for is compatible with my will. These are, this chaplet is prayed on ordinary rosary beads. Uh, and it's very simple to do. You begin with the, out, with the uh, sign, of, sign of the cross. You say, in our Father, Hail Mary, and the uh, Apostles' Creed. On the uh, Our Father beads, you pray the prayer of the St. Faustine that told us, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul, and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. And then you pray the shorter prayer on each of the ten Hail Mary beads. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. You repeat that for the five decades and close it out with, Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. You pray that three times. And then there is an optional concluding prayer if you wish, but you always finish the chaplet with, Jesus, I trust in you, and say it three times. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. And now I'm going to ask Catherine to come and finish it with the hour of mercy.
Okay, yes, we are going to finish this up with the hour of mercy. The hour of mercy is very clearly the three o'clock hour. That's when our Lord died on the cross and his greatest mercy poured forth from his pierced side. Um, the blood and water was gushed forth, went into the only pure vessel, the Blessed Mother, and from that, the mercy of Jesus has been released and is stored and ready for us to ask come to him and uh, receive that mercy. So the hour of mercy, uh, the Lord said that it was a very important hour at the three o'clock when he, when he died, and his words to her are, at the three o'clock hour, implore my mercy, especially for sinners. And if only for a brief moment, immerse yourself in my passion, particularly in my abandonment at the moment of agony. This is the hour of great mercy. In this hour, I will refuse nothing of the soul that makes a request of me in virtue of my passion. Nothing will be refused. This entry 1320. As often as you hear the clock strike the third hour, immerse yourself completely in my mercy, adoring and glorifying it. Invoke its omnipotence for the whole world, particularly for poor sinners. For at that moment, mercy was opened wide for every soul. In this hour, you can obtain everything for yourself and for others for the asking. It was the hour of grace for the whole world. Mercy triumphed over justice. And what the Lord is asking for at the three o'clock hour is to pray the stations of the cross. They're not just for Lent. They're for every day at three o'clock. Pray the Stations of the Cross. If you can't get and pray the Stations of the Cross in a church, then you can pray the Chapel of Divine Mercy. If you can't even do that, pause for a moment and just say, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. One of the things I've done over the over time, over the years, is that I have set my phone um, to send a reminder at three o'clock to. I'll beep at that time so that if I can't get away to do anything else, I can at least pause and join myself to the Lord and say, Jesus, I trust in you. I'll tell you a real brief story about my, uh, my dad. Um, at the end of my dad's life, he was at the VA hospital and he had suffered a stroke. My dad had dementia. At this point, he had suffered a stroke and was paralyzed and couldn't use his hands, which was really hard on me. Because my dad and I, when I would always go to visit him, he'd always reach out his hand to me and we would hold hands uh, all the time. When he would see me coming down the hall, he'd have his hands out and we'd hold hands. And so not to have him reach out his hand to me was, um, was difficult. Um, so in August, just before he passed away, uh, my sister-in-law was in the VA hospital with me, and it struck three o'clock, and I asked her if she wanted to do the chapter of Divine Mercy. I'd been praying for my dad's soul continually, and she said, of course. So she stood on one side of my dad, I stood on the other, and my dad was, the sheet was tight around his neck because his hands uh, were paralyzed, moving and not able to move, and uh, we began the chaplet, and he just had his eyes gazing on me, but he glanced over at her and smiled, and but he kept glancing at me and his eyes were fixed on me. And I had my eyes fixed on my dad. And as we prayed the chaplain, I was begging the Lord for mercy, begging the Lord that my dad would go home peacefully to join my mom and to be, to get to heaven. And I prayed that I would be with him in his hour of death. And as my sister-in-law and I were praying the chaplain and tears are going down my cheeks I was so intent on my prayers, God gave me gift. Out from under the covers, on the right side, came my dad's hand as he smiled at me and lifted it up so we could hold hands for the rest of the chapel. Maybe realize God was with me, with my dad, and I continued to pray for my dad. A couple of days later, on early Wednesday morning, early morning hours, I was praying for my dad and praying the chaplet and it got to be three o'clock in the morning and I was praying intently and the, 
phone rang at 10 after 3, and I knew. I answered the phone, and I said, he's gone, isn't he? And she said, yes, your dad passed away moments after 3 o'clock. Again, there was to me a great message from God that he heard and he answered my prayers. I was to be with dad, and I was okay with that, but God was with him. And my prayers were answered. The hour of God's great, great mercy was upon my dear. A um, couple of things my husband and I wanted to kind of mention about divine mercy is um, how important it is to pray for the dying and the deceased. How very, very important it is for us to pray for the dying and the deceased. Um, you can pray for your loved ones. You can right, ask others to pray. It's a great um, work of mercy to daily pray the chaplet for the dying and that they will be received in the arms of Jesus and Mary and brought to heaven. Um, another great um, thing is to understand that God is outside of time, so our loved ones have passed away previous to this. You can still pray the chaplet of divine mercy for their soul at the hour of death. It says so in Mary. Sister Faustina's diary that at the hour of death God will glance our way three times and if we just so much as glance at him he's beckoning us to save us if we just glance at him he will bring us to himself because he can't impose himself on our free will bring, him, bring us to himself and save us so we can pray for our loved ones it's an important thing a beautiful article. Yeah, very important also, especially uh, all, pretty much all of our families have been touched by someone who has uh, been the victim of suicide. And uh, one thing that we have learned through Divine Mercy is that because God is outside of time, that our prayers can be taken and applied to the moment of their death, uh, no matter what the circumstances of that death were. And so we can pray now for someone who may have suffered from suicide uh, many or years sudden, ago. Or even a sudden death. Or, or a yeah, sudden death. death. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe a, a vehicle accident or something. That you can pray for that soul now, uh, no matter how many years have gone by, because God is, is, he is not bound by time. We are. But uh, there, there's a great book booklet that... Uh, the Marians of the Immaculate Conception put out uh, about praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet for family members who have suffered in suicide. And so that, that offers great hope to family members um, for the salvation of those, of those souls. And so we thought it would be good to close this evening with praises of the Divine Mercy. And they're very simple. And Catherine and I will, will trade off on praying those prayers. Sure. In the name of the Father, and the Son, Son and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. The praises of the divine mercy. Love of God is the flower, and mercy is the fruit. Let the doubting soul read these considerations on mercy and become trusting. Divine mercy gushing forth from the bosom of the Father, I trust in you. Divine mercy, greatest attribute of God, I trust in you. Divine mercy, incomprehensible mystery, I trust in you. Divine mercy, fountain gushing forth from the mystery of the most blessed Trinity, I trust in you. Divine mercy, unfathomed by any intellect, human or angelic, I trust in you. Divine mercy, from which wells forth all life and happiness, I trust in you. Divine mercy, better than the heavens, I trust in you. Divine mercy, source of miracles and wonders, I trust in you. Divine mercy, encompassing the whole universe, I trust in you. Divine mercy, descending to earth in the person of the incarnate Word, I trust in you. Divine mercy, which flowed out from the open wound of the heart of Jesus. I trust in you. 
Divine mercy enclosed in the heart of Jesus for us and especially for sinners. I trust in you. Divine mercy unfathomed in the institution of the sacred host. I trust in you. Divine mercy in the founding of Holy Church. I trust in you. Divine mercy in the sacrament of holy baptism. I trust in you. Divine mercy in our justification through Jesus Christ. I trust in you. Divine mercy accompanying us through our whole life. I trust in you. Divine mercy embracing us especially at the hour of death. I trust in you. Divine mercy endowing, endowing us with immortal life. I trust in you. Divine mercy accompanying us at every moment of our life. I trust in you. Divine mercy shielding us from the fire of hell. I trust in you. Divine mercy in the conversion of hardened sinners. I trust in you. Divine mercy, astonishment for angels incomprehensible to saints. I trust in you. Divine mercy, unfathomed in all the mysteries of God. I trust in you. Divine mercy, lifting us out of every misery. I trust in you. Divine mercy, source of our happiness and joy. I trust in you. Divine mercy, in calling us forth from nothingness to existence. I trust in you. Divine mercy, embracing all the works of his hands. I trust in you. Divine mercy, crown of all God's handiwork. I trust in you. Divine mercy, in which we are all immersed. I trust in you. Divine mercy, sweet relief for anguished hearts. I trust in you. Divine mercy, only hope of despairing souls. I trust in you. Divine mercy, repose of hearts, peace amidst fear. I trust in you. Divine mercy, delight and ecstasy of holy souls. I trust in you. Divine mercy, inspiring hope against all hope. I trust in you. And then we'll pray this last prayer to the Mother of God, the Mother of Mercy. O Mary, my Mother and my Lady, I offer you my soul, my body, my life, and my death, and all that will follow it. I place everything in your hands. O my Mother, cover my soul with your virginal mantle and grant me the grace of purity of heart, soul, and body. Defend me with your power against all enemies and especially against those who hide their malice behind the mask of virtue. Fortify my soul that pain will not break it. Mother of grace, teach me to live by God's power. O Mary, a terrible sword has pierced your holy soul. Except for God, no one knows of your suffering. Your soul does not break, it is brave, because it is with Jesus. Sweet Mother, unite my soul to Jesus, because it is only then that I am able to endure all trials and tribulations, and only in union with Jesus will my little sacrifices be pleasing to God. Sweetest Mother, continue to teach me about the interior life. May the sword of suffering never break me, O pure virgin, pour courage into my heart and guard it. Amen. Amen. In the Father, and the, Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And this is just a reminder now that, uh, to be prepared for the Divine Mercy you know, uh, celebration this coming Sunday. The reminder is to go to confession, to pray the Divine Mercy Novena, Celebrate with us this Sunday, April 11th at 3 o'clock p.m. at Nativity. And what we will do is process the image, have do a Eucharistic Holy Hour with the Divine Mercy Chaplet, uh, use some blessed oil of St. Faustina, and celebrate benediction. And with that, we'd like to ask our God to offer his blessing to all of you. And we ask Jesus, our divine healer, to be with all who are sick or who are anxious in any way. And that uh, we ask him to send his healing touch upon us and to guide the hands and the minds of those medical teams that are working with us. And we ask this through Christ's name. And we ask the Father, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to bless you all. Amen. Amen.
Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Yeah.